um, as we begin a new series of this week that's going to come from the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah in the Old Testament. If you're looking for where that is in the Bible in the rack in front of you, uh, you want to turn to page number 469 in that black, that Bible that sits there in the rack in front of you. Um, Book of Nehemiah is where we're going to take some time um, over the next several weeks to dive into a little bit. And there is really an incredible backstory to this Old Testament book. First, I want you to realize that there is a connection between the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah. Both of these uh, stories tell the story, the story of the rebuilding, the reestablishment of the nation of Israel. But I want to talk a little bit about how we get to this point in the book of Nehemiah. It was a sin issue. There was sin in the nation of Israel. And God dealt with the sin of Israel when he permitted successive world powers. There was the Assyrian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire. They all had their way with the people of Yahweh. And finally, then the unthinkable happened. The Babylonian Empire completely decimated what was the center of life in Israel, the jewel in the crown of their nation. In the year 586 B.C., the city of Jerusalem was utterly destroyed. It, the walls were torn down. It was reduced to rubbles. The gates were smashed. And everything was set on fire. And one of the main reasons conquering empires like the Babylonians would do this was to make sure that the remaining population got the following message. Try to rebuild this city. We'll return. And when we do, we'll kill you. In other words, in other words, rebuilding what was broken was considered to be rebellion. It was considered to be revolt. And they said, we will crush you like you crush an ant. And finally, when when a conquering empire, maybe they subdued another, they would forcibly remove the best, the brightest, those considered the most beautiful, the talented from the land, and they would leave behind the poorest, the marginalized, the powerless, reinforcing that idea that they Their land was nothing. Now, just stop for a moment. Can you think about how humiliating, humiliating this must have been to the people of Israel? Because the people of Israel were chosen specifically by God. The people of Israel were led out of captivity in Egypt by God. The people of of, of Israel were told to overtake the promised land by God. The people of Israel were led by judges, prophets, kings, chosen by God. And now they were going to be ruled over, dominated by other empires that God used for that exact purpose. That's just mind-boggling. But then, God. But then God. Here's what I want you to take away today. God will use whatever means necessary to restore that which has been decimated, broken, destroyed, even when it has occurred primarily because we have refused to become the people, his people, that he has always desired we become. And so we're going to rebuild, we're going to start this uh, story in the book of Nehemiah This account of rebuilding of the broken walls of Jerusalem. It starts in a place that you would least likely think it would begin. The last place you would consider. There's a room where it happens. Or as a character in the musical Hamilton sings the song in the room where it happens. No one really knows how the parties get to yes. The pieces that are sacrificed in every game of chess. We just assume that it happens, but no one else is in the room where it happens. But in this case, but in this case, there are some key people in the room where it happens. Read with me, beginning in Nehemiah chapter 1. The words of Nehemiah, son of Hekeliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, 
One of my brothers came from Judah with some other men, and, and I questioned them about uh, the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and, and had returned uh, also about Jerusalem. And then they said to me, those who survived the exile, they're back in the province. They're in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. Its gates have been burned with fire. And when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer of your servant. His praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed your commands, decrees, and laws that you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses saying, if you are faithful, I will scatter, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeem by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. Cupbearer to the king. That's what we read about Nehemiah. It's important and incredibly fascinating that it's at this point in this very first chapter in the book of Nehemiah, we find out that this man was a cupbearer in the palace of the king of the Persian king, Artaxerxes. And according to historians, it's believed that this role of wine steward or cupbearer is so highly esteemed that they would be considered worthy of the king's complete confidence. There are other people who write that this individual was the one who kept the king's signet ring, the official seal or signature of the king. The cupbearer had access and proximity to the king unlike anyone else. And Nehemiah knew he was in the exact place that one needed to be to ask about addressing the appalling situation the regarding the walls of the city of Jerusalem. Again, verse 3, he said, those who survived the exile are back in the province, and they're in great trouble. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates have been burned with fire. Folks, why would this matter to the cupbearer of the king. Why did arguably the second most powerful official in the court of the king of Persia, one of the greatest kingdoms, ancient kingdoms, care about anything like this? Well, there's a couple of things that I think are important not to miss when it comes to reading about this case. First, when we read about Nehemiah, Nehemiah doesn't care about himself. He's more focused on this city that's considered to be the center of uh, Jewish culture, life, and religion. Second, Nehemiah is not focused on the nice things that he has access to. Even though he's the cupbearer, he doesn't really care about that. He's centered on the compromised situation of the people of God. Walls are broken. Gates are burned down. In other words, the people who are living in Jerusalem, they're not safe. They're in danger. Because an unsecured city in ancient times, an unwalled city in ancient times, would make economic development, it would make commercial development, it would make safety an overall problem. It's the same attitude that we see Paul addresses when he talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He talks about where Jesus did something similar. Jesus displayed on the cross that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Now, before we move on from recognizing the access, this proximity that the cupbearer, Nehemiah, has to empower power, it's important to note this. Nehemiah was dedicated to prayer. For some days, he says, I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. 
Nehemiah was genuine in expressing his heart in prayer. We read in verse 4, he says, When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. Nehemiah made it a point to be sacrificial in his prayers. He says, For some days I mourned and fasted. Nehemiah was persistent in his prayer. He prayed for some days. And verse 6 of that first chapter, your servant is praying before you day and night. There's something else I picked up in this verse of Scripture, in this chapter of Scripture that I had missed. When Nehemiah prays, he prays a prayer of repentance. In, he says that he wants to pray for his sins, the sins of Israel, and the sins of of his father. He recognizes that there's generational problems that have been going on for years and years and years. Ultimately, we learn that this prayer is what opened the door of possibility for Nehemiah's return to rebuild these broken and burned walls of Jerusalem. That's what made it a reality. But what about you and I? What about us? When we have incredible proximity, not just to the king of Assyria, we have proximity to the king of the universe. Only our king, our king's not on a throne. He's not an empire ruler. He rules all the empires. Are we making the most of our opportunity, of that proximity to our king, speaking to him about whatever's troubling, disruptive, or some rebuilding effort that maybe we need to be a part of? So the cupbearer to the king, he's obedient in prayer, and he looks to see how God might use him to accomplish this long overdue task, the rebuilding of these walls of Jerusalem. Then Nehemiah does something that only makes sense to do when you're faced with a task that he's faced with. He requests, he makes a request, and then he's tasked with a mission a mission from the king. Pick it up with me in Nehemiah chapter 2. Pick it up with verse 1. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. And I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? And the king said to me, what is it that you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king. If it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, how long will your journey take and when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I hope you caught something significant in that passage. It's a long passage of scripture, I know. But Nehemiah began feeling compelled about the problems of Jerusalem in the month of Kislev, that's where we started. The month of Kislev is where he first began to pray. But now we read he's in a different month, month of Nisan. That means quite likely, according to how ancient records were calendaring, how it was all kept, there are over 100 days that had passed since reading about Nehemiah being the cupbearer to the king and now him being in front of the king. So the question is, why does that matter? Why, why would it matter that it was maybe a 100 days? Perhaps, perhaps that extra time was needed for God to continue to do work in Nehemiah's heart and mind so that when he does stand before the king, he knows exactly what to ask for. Perhaps that extra time is needed for Nehemiah to gather more information about the surrounding region around Jerusalem so that when he does end up there, he's not caught off guard by the severity of the situation. Perhaps the extra time gives Nehemiah the best possible moment to approach the king in which the king is most likely to be inclined to hear, to honor the request of his most trusted court official. Whatever the reason is, 
do not miss the fact that God may call you to slow a thing down. God may call you to trust his process even though it involves more time. I love that even with all the encouragement we see Jesus giving to the disciples in Matthew 28, 19, Jesus says this, Jesus says to the disciples, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. But then over in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, we read these words, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. Sometimes, friends, the mission for the king involves slowing down. Friends, there's something else I want you to take note of. In this story, this request to rebuild the walls, the gates, the city of Jerusalem. When the king asked Nehemiah, who was no doubt aware, there was a rule in the court of kings like this. When the king is happy, what do you think? Everybody's happy. Is that like when mama's happy? Right? It was the same rule here. When the king is sad, you're sad. You don't get to come into the king's presence being anything different than what the king is. Yet in this instance, it's the king who immediately notices an issue. Nehemiah has both an answer and a plan when he's asked. Nehemiah says, I answered the king. If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. And just like that, in the months of prayer and wrestling with what could have or should have been said to the king, months of dedicated fasting, self-denial, they've come down to talking to the king about what the God of heaven has made very clear must be done. Have you ever found yourself in a situation like that? where there's something you've thought about, something you've prayed about, something you've sought counsel over, something for months and months and months, and now the moment is on you. All those prayers, all that counsel, all that trust, now the right conditions are upon you that you've dreamed of, and it's now time to step out. That's where Nehemiah is as he prepares to embark on this mission for the king. So now... Nehemiah's done it. He's actually verbalized what, what's on his mind and his heart. He has been praying this for the last four months, possibly. A request to return to his ancestral homeland to do what must be done. And the very first order is to make sure of this. He wants to make sure that he's outfitted by the king. He is set up for success by the king. Now, this verse of script, this passage of scripture is very long, so don't fall asleep while I read it, but it's critical. It's critical to understand why this, why this man did what he did and how he was empowered to do what he did. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 7, we read these words. He says, I also said to him, after being asked, why are you sad and I'm not sad? Basically, he says, I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters from the governors of the trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. Judah is where Jerusalem is. Until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the royal park, so that he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall, for the residence that I will occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my request. So I went to the governors of the trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king had sent a great, had sent an army officers and a cavalry with me. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah, the Ammonite official, heard about this. They were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. This is a bold, confident, assertive, timely ask that Nehemiah makes of the king. And what I really want us to notice, however, is the immediate opposition in group form, 
that arrives, Sanballat and Tobiah. Kind of amazing when you, when you think about it. Nehemiah had no doubt, many others who knew about the treacherous state that Jerusalem in was in. As a matter of fact, Nehemiah wasn't even the first one to undertake this restoring of Jerusalem. There were like several decades earlier in the Bible, there had been an attempt to restore Jerusalem by an exile of the previous empire, Babylonia, that had overtaken Israel. His name was Zerubbabel. Everybody say after me, Zerubbabel. 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 Zerubbabel we read about in the book of Ezra. Remember I said Ezra and Nehemiah are connected. And we read about Zerubbabel. His efforts were frustrated. They were short-circuited. And he accomplished very little of what he set out to do. And in this case, it's clear that the opposition mentioned came most likely because the work of Nehemiah, the work of rebuilding, of restoring. What it was going to do was going to diminish the cultural, economic, political, and possibly the religious advantages that those individuals had enjoyed and exploited for years. Please don't miss this. These people were upset. These people opposed the efforts and the alarming conditions that I mentioned earlier. People weren't safe. Remember I said people aren't safe here. People are in danger because there's an unsecured city. It's an unwalled city. Making um, economic development, making commercial development, overall safety was a problem. And these guys wanted to confront that? Somebody to try to make that right? And they were about to be addressed once and for all. And someone, Nehemiah, he has now come at the approval of the king with uh, uh, supplies from the king, military support from the king, completely outfitted. He's going to promote the welfare of the Israelites. I'd be sad too if I had been making my living and reputation off the misery, the pain, the despondency of those living in this region for many years. And those days are about to come to an end. And the king has sent Nehemiah to do a work that is long overdue. Nehemiah is a cupbearer to the king. Uniquely situated to deal with the troubles of Jerusalem. Nehemiah knows without question what his mission for the king is going to require. Nehemiah is fully equipped for the accomplishing of the mission. He's outfitted. He's got all of his stuff. Here's the last thing that I want us to look at this morning. After all of that, Nehemiah sets out to begin rebuilding in the name of the king. This is what we read. Pick it up in verse 17 of chapter 2. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of my God on me, what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. So they began to work. But, <laughs> but when Sanballat, the Horonite, Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and Geshem, the Arab, heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you're doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? I answered by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. Here's the thing that can't be missed in this assessment from Nehemiah. He says immediately, after taking time in chapter 2 to kind of walk and to tour the walls and the gates of the city, he says this, oh, this is bad. No, this is really bad. Peter Kostenbaum, he's an author, business consultant. And he encourages folks to do exactly what Nehemiah does here in chapter 2. He says this, face reality as it is, not as you wish it to be. There are critical keys 
to this rebuilding work that Nehemiah is doing. First, friends, he's not doing it solo. <laughs> Verse 17, he says, come let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, and we will no longer be in disgrace. The next thing we see, Nehemiah recognizes that even with strength in numbers and others to come alongside and to do this work, it won't be enough because he says, I told them about the gracious hand of my God on me and what the king had said to me. The response of the people who recognize the good work that they're involved in is often just as we see here in this passage. The workers then exclaim, let's go. Let's go. As this chapter concludes, chapter 2 concludes, it's critical to note the resistance that Nehemiah encounters. But rather, I think it's what's most important, or what you and I can take a lesson from, is how Nehemiah responds to this now expanding team of naysayers because there's been an additional name. You may have missed it. A Geshem, the Arab, now comes to kind of stand there and go, <laughs> right? This is what we're introduced to back in verse 10. The God of heaven, Nehemiah says, will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding, but as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. This early resistance, their interference, we'll see later. The response that Nehemiah and the people have pays off significant dividends as they accomplish the task of rebuilding the walls, the gates, the city of Jerusalem. Nehemiah reminds you and I of the importance of being crystal clear from the very beginning with those who might oppose the effort of what we believe God is calling us to do. I believe this is the realization of the saying, very often how things begin can be indicative of how things end. Very often how things begin can be indicative of how things end. What would it look like in 2024 to rebuild? To rebuild in the name of the king, of our king. To restore that which has been decimated, reduced to rubble because of our sin. Ben Watson was considering retirement. But there was a new opportunity that appeared. And staying true to his aggressive playing style, he jumped on the opportunity. He was a former tight end for the New Orleans Saints. And Watson was disturbed about what appeared to be an intentional burning of three historical black churches in and around Louisiana. So the NFL veteran used his sizable social media following to spread the news and to help assist in the fundraising to rebuild. He also retweeted the following. He said this, It's imperative to show that we show this community in the entire country that these types of acts do not represent who we are. And most importantly, as the body of Christ, we suffer alongside our brothers and sisters whenever tragedy, persecution, or loss happens. St. Mary Baptist Church in Port Bar, Greater Union Baptist Church in Opelousas, and Mount Pleasant Baptist Church in Opelousas. We're all burned within a 10-day span. And police eventually arrested a young man by the name of Holden Matthews in connection with those fires. But Watson spoke on the phone with, past, with the pastors from all three of those Louisiana churches, and he marveled at their demeanor. And speaking with these pastors, he says, I am in awe and inspired by their faith and courage, comforting their congregations and family members. Through sadness and shock, they spoke of forgiveness for the arsonists and grace for tomorrow. Most importantly, they spoke of being overwhelmed by support from people of goodwill and all religions from around the country, and they were humbled by what God has already done 
through this series of events. Humbled by what God has done. This will be the story we see as we journey through the book of Nehemiah time and time again. We'll see how God works through what seems to be impossible sequences of events because that's what God does. God is the rebuilder of broken walls. Would you pray with me? God, there is nothing new under your sun. Lord, these accounts that come to us from Scripture, like this account from Nehemiah, Lord, they are intended to help us to see that there is nothing beyond you. There is nothing that you haven't seen before, and there is nothing, God, that you cannot do. So, God, as we take time to recognize and to praise you and to worship you as the rebuilder, Lord, whatever it is in our own hearts and our own lives, Lord, that needs rebuilding, may we surrender it to you. Take away our, our fear, our hesitancy. Lord, the uncertainty that comes along in a journey like the one that Nehemiah has undertaken. Lord, we believe, we want to be used by you. God, we are humbled by your faithfulness. We love you. We thank you. We pray this in your son's name.